Welcome to Norwich Northworth Methodist Church's with Reverend Mary Sachikonye. Indeed, good morning. Good morning, all. Our call to worship this morning is coming from Psalm 129. I'll read. From my earliest youth, my enemies have persecuted me. Let Israel now say. From my earliest youth, my enemies have persecuted me, but they've never been able to finish me off. My back is covered with cuts, as if a farmer had plowed long furrows. But the Lord is good. He has cut the cords used by the ungodly to bind me. May all who hate Jerusalem be turned back in shameful defeat. May they be useless as grass on a rooftop, turning yellow when only half grown. That's our call to worship. Amen. from the Methodist website service for the 10th of January and the Secretary of the Conference's prayer for our current lockdown. We gather before you, Creator God, to bring you our praise and worship and to experience your love for us. As we heed the call to remain in our homes, help us there to serve you faithfully. Be with us. Unite us with our family of faith. Refresh us, body, mind and soul, and open our hearts to your word. Amen. The Old Testament reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, beginning to read at the first verse. Words of hope. Comfort my people, says our God. Comfort them. Encourage the people of Jerusalem. Tell them they have suffered long enough, and their sins are now forgiven. I have punished them in full for all their sins. A voice cries out, Prepare in the wilderness a road for the Lord. Clear the way in the desert for our God. Fill every valley, level every mountain. The hills will become a plain, and the rough country will be made smooth, 
Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind will see it. The Lord himself has promised this. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. Our um, reading today comes from Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were I accursed from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth pertaineth the adoption of the and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over who is overall God blessed forever. Amen. May God bless the reading of the Bible. Time to talk to the children about the love of God. As you uh, you see, um, there's a picture of little hearts and the Theo wrote at the top, God loves us all. Hallelujah. That's quite encouraging for our children to know the love of God. We love them, but God loves them more. There's nothing that encourages us as human beings to know that we are being loved. As children, we, we want to feel the love of our parents. And it is good for us as children as well to give that love back to our friends, to our families, to, 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 to the society by being good children. We know when you have got love, you don't boast, you don't show off, love is kind, love is humble. And the other week I had um, Alex singing about the love of God that is so wide, that is so deep, that is so low. And this is the love that Theo is talking about. God loves us all. And the love of God and the gift that God gives us never fades. It never ages. It never wear off. So as children, as we start uh, this new year, 2021, and young people, let us be encouraged to have that heart that is full of love. The way God loves us, the way our parents love, love us, is the same way that we should show love to a hurting world. We are in another lockdown. We don't know what's tomorrow holds but we can pull it together if we've got love let us love one another and we can we can make the difference let us pray thank you heavenly father for the gift of children and the love that we continue to show each other i thank you god for those little hands that are able to write about your love bless all the children god we are living in days and times where love is hardly noticed because of the facial masks that cover our mouths. May we show our love and smiles by our eyes. We thank you, God, for everything that, that you have done for us and that you continue to do for us as young people and as children. We thank you, Father. Amen and Amen.
Sadly, in our world today, we see anti-Semitism raising its ugly head again. Not only in the rise of extreme right-wing groups in Europe and America, but even it seems in the Labour Party in Britain. Christians, of course, must stand against evil and hatred in any form perhaps especially against hatred of the Jewish people, because without the Jews and Judaism, Christianity wouldn't exist in the first place. It isn't simply the case, as Christians sometimes seem to imagine, that Jesus had to belong to some race and it just happened to be the Jewish one. No, Jesus only makes sense as a Jew. Think about it. Take the Advent hymns. They celebrate the fact that Jesus is the fulfilment of the hope, not of the world. The world wasn't hoping for anything much, except this war and lower taxes. But it was for the hope of Israel. Come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Every line of that great hymn shouts that Jesus is the fulfilment of all that Israel had hoped for, had longed for. If Advent means anything, it means the coming of the Messiah to Israel. Hark, the glad sound, the Saviour comes, the Saviour promised long. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth, thou art. And he is the hope of all the earth, simply because he is Israel's strength and consolation. We read Isaiah 40 each Advent, comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. We're claiming that in the coming of Jesus, God has finally fulfilled his word of promise to Israel. It isn't only Advent. The same is true. Christmas. Who come ye, who come ye to Bethlehem, because that is where the Jewish royal family comes from. To you in David's town this day is born from David's line, the Saviour, who is the Messiah. Many who sing those words unthinkingly would be shocked if someone displayed the Star of David outside their church. Hail, the Son of Righteousness. In other words, the one whom the prophet Malachi foretold as the great hope of the Jewish people. Christmas, like Advent, only means anything if we're celebrating the birth of the Jewish Messiah. If we're not making that claim, then we might as well sing Deck the hall with boughs of holly and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Call it quits. Christmas would just be a pagan festival for the winter solstice. Now, you might want to remind me that Jesus Christ is the saviour of the world, not just of the Jews. And that's very true. But that belief is itself a profoundly Jewish belief. Epiphany only makes sense because the kings of the earth coming to do homage to the Jewish boy king. The kings come to the king of kings, and he is king of kings because, and only because, that's what Israel's kings were always supposed to be. Read the Psalms, you'll see it again and again. King of kings and Lord of lords. Maybe that reminds you of the words of Handel's Messiah. But about 90% of the words of the Messiah, including the bulk of the story of Jesus himself, comes not from the New Testament, but from the prophecies in the Old Testament. When you celebrate Holy Communion, you're remembering the Last Supper, which was a Jewish liberation party in memory of the Jewish Messiah. We could follow the story right through from Christmas and Epiphany to Good Friday and Easter to Ascension and Pentecost. The same thing is true throughout. The whole Christian scheme only makes sense when it's claiming to be the fulfilment of all that Israel longed for. The Jewish roots of Christianity are also woven into the liturgy, which many churches sing and say week after week. He has come to the help of his servant Israel. Take that away, you've robbed the, robbed the Magnificat, its great climax. Then there's the Nunc Dimittis, my own eyes have seen the salvation. You have prepared in the sight of every people a light to reveal you to the nations. Yes, yes indeed, but only because this child is first and foremost the glory 
of your people Israel. Take away the claim that Christianity is the fulfilment of the hope of Israel, and you lose Christian liturgy as well as Christian theology. Essential Christian claims all involve the claim that Jesus is the one promised to Israel. Jesus is the saviour of the world because Israel was called to be God's means of saving the world, and because, Christians claim, Jesus has fulfilled that great hope. Throughout Christian history, the potential for anti-Semitism has been present, but it shouldn't have been. Christians have connived at it, contributed to it, and even spurred it on its way. But in doing so, they've been acting as pagans, not as Christians. The Christian gospel tells us to love our neighbours, even our enemies. It doesn't allow us the option of hatred or persecution. Christianity started out as part of Judaism and a weak and downtrodden part of that. But later on, particularly after the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, Christians were in power. And there were those who felt that because Christianity was the true religion, that everyone else should be forced to convert, pagans or Jews alike. Later on, during the Enlightenment, people rejected such views and said that the Jewish people should be left alone to live their own lives. But sadly, others looked to much of the teaching of the church, in particular that the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus, and they used that as a reason to persecute them. That, of course, wasn't Jews who sentenced Jesus to death and who carried out the death sentence. It was Romans, Gentiles, people like you and me. But despite that, from the Greek church father John Christostom, in the early period, to the 16th century reformer Martin Luther, on to Christian scholars in Nazi Germany, there have been great thinkers and teachers within the Christian tradition who have denounced the Jews in ways which make our blood run cold today. And our blood runs cold, of course, not least because of the Holocaust. But how did the Holocaust happen? I don't want to blame it on the church. Adolf Hitler wasn't a Christian, though he was educated at a Catholic school. But the anti-Semitism that sent six million Jews to their deaths in civilised Europe had its real roots not in the New Testament, but in the pagan teaching of various European philosophers and the pagan culture of Richard Wagner. Christians who could perhaps have stopped it if they'd spoken out early enough, by and large did nothing. Sin of omission as bad as the sin of commission. The church's part in all of this is tragic because the New Testament contains a striking and central passage, Romans chapters 9 to 11, which warns in no uncertain terms against the possibility that the church might go down the route of pagan anti-Semitism. The tragedy is that Romans 9 to 11 was marginalised by the reformers' concentration on chapters 1 to 8, bits about justification by faith. So the church had lost sight of what Paul was saying about our Jewish roots, so that when the church should have stood up and objected to what was going on, she had lost the key to a vital part of her armoury. Instead, prejudice and hatred, the very thing which the Christian gospel renounces and denounces, became enshrined in supposedly Christian society. The charge of anti-Semitism is a charge properly levelled against paganism, whether in ancient Rome, the early church, medieval or 19th century Europe, 20th century Stalinist Russia or Nazi Germany, or alas, 21st century Britain, France and America. But many of these pagans have claimed to be Christians. It's a first-rate smoke scheme. And they claim to be acting on what the church has taught about the Jews. And in a terrible, perverted way, they have a point. And today we see the rise of anti-Semitism again. The sort of anti-Jewish literature that we associate with Hitler's propaganda is on sale in increasing quantities all over Europe and Russia and its former satellites, in the Arab countries and in Japan. There are groups in America who not only deny the 
the Holocaust happen, but even propagate the very teachings that made it happen. And if anti-Jewish activity breaks out, then we as Christians must make the right response this time. We must stand up and say that it is blasphemous. Anti-Jewish behaviour is a pagan vice to which Christians should be opposed as much as they should be to extortion or fornication or witchcraft. To the extent that Christians have connived against anti-Judaism, they've allowed their faith to slide towards paganism. Christianity is not itself anti-Semitic or anti-Judaic. It's often been lured to guilty association with it, and it must learn the lesson. So what is the proper Christian response to this sorry state of affairs? One approach would be through Paul's letter to the Romans, which I've already mentioned. Why has Israel not believed in the Messiah? What is God doing about it? In those great chapters, Romans 9 to 11, Paul, the one-time hardline Pharisee, wrestles with this issue in the presence of God. And he comes up with an astonishing and theologically brilliant answer. God wanted to save the world by drawing its evil onto himself in the person of his son and so exhausting its power. For this to happen, he chose a people and prepared them to be the family to which the son would be born. This people, as part of the plan, were themselves sinful, like the pagans so that when the Messiah came, he would be born into and would die under the full weight of the world's sin. But if this people focused their attention on their own special status and not on their vocation, then they would reject the Messiah, whose Jewish vision was to rescue the whole world. And that is what happened. As Paul says, they didn't understand God's strange purpose. They were trying to establish a private purpose and a status of their own. But the Messiah brings God's strange purpose to its completion, so that all humans, not just Jews, can become God's chosen people. So what then about the Jews themselves? Are they to miss out at last? Was Christianity meant to have one generation of Jews only, and then no more? Were ex-pagans, now become Christians, going to be able to look down at Jews, and say the kingdom of God now belongs to us and you have no part in it. How could that possibly be correct? Paul's answer is categorical. All humans are sinful, Jews as well as Greeks, and all need humbling at the gate of God's kingdom. Gentiles, by being invited to join an essentially Jewish family. Jews, by being invited into the family which was theirs in a sense, but into which a larger number of Gentiles been adopted with equal rights. Come, come Emmanuel and ransom captive Israel. Hark, the glad sound, the Saviour comes, the Saviour promised long to the Jewish people. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for a wonderful message this morning. Thank you. We are continuing to encourage uh, each other on offering as we see we are in another lockdown, which we didn't um, expect, but we are living in unprecedented times where we have to continue our worship uh, online, at the same time encouraging uh, each other to continue with our free will uh, offertory. It's no pressure on anyone. Uh, things are different and people afford in different ways. So let us continue to be cheerful givers so that our churches may continue to function at the end of all this. It is my plea this morning that we feel moved to those who can we can give in different ways form shape prayer time everything that we do is giving to god now today we are going to hear our offertory uh, prayer from john over to you john almighty god we offer our gift to you of time and money 
as a token of our love for you. It is only a token because we can never repay you for your love that you gave us through your sacrifice for us on the cross. Bless those who have given their life as a devotion to, as a devotion to you and bless the money we give so that it will be used wisely in your kingdom on earth. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray for all people in all parts of this troubled world and in all kinds of need. Lord, shine your light upon those who live in danger of violence, persecution, oppression, displacement, loss and injustice because of race, belief, gender or who they are. We pray that the hearts of those who visit the evils of prejudice and greed upon others may be turned from darkness and awakened to the true light in the love and compassion of the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, shine your light upon your church and upon all people of faith that their love may shine in the darkness, uniting in their endeavours for the common good. May we, in the ministries which are our lives, proclaim the good news as our faith shines forth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, shine your light upon those who suffer in mind, body or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your redeeming love. We pray also for those who love and care for them. We name in our thoughts any known to us who are in special need of our prayers in a moment of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, shine your light upon those who mourn. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, a light which no darkness can quench. We remember before God those who have died and light a candle to symbolise the light of Christ which eternally shines and brings hope. We remember our loved ones who have passed before us. Lord, you turn our darkness into light. In your light shall we see light. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you. May the peace of the Lord be with you. May the peace of the Lord be with us all. Peace, peace be with you.
Thank you for watching our service channel today and joining us in fellowship. Please feel free to share, like, or subscribe. And please do note that it's free to subscribe. Thank you.